OK, so we've developed the TTC, the Generalized Time and Transfer Constant Method. And we, we know we can use it to calculate that any transfer function to any desired level of accuracy, including exactly accurate if needed. So we'll one more time use this to look at our three fundamental stages, right? The common source slash common emitter, common drain slash common uh, collector, and common base slash common gate. So those are the key building blocks of the system. And we want to look at the frequency response and see if they have, we have looked at them in bits and pieces here and there. We want to look at them one more time, make sure we haven't missed anything of significance. Or if there's something else that we can actually learn by using these methods and learn extra from that. And we will be able to kind of skip over some of these things because we've covered a lot of the details before. So we were not going to go into everything in full detail, just like anything. So let's start with the common emitter slash common source, right? So this is basically a stage where you have an input um, device and an, so, so you have the, the input is applied to the base or the gate of the transistor. The output is taken from the drain um, or the, the collector of the transistor. There's a load resistor here, there's a load resistor there and you can actually use either one of them. So we'll do it actually in terms of a bipolar transistor because that has the R pi, so it's actually a more general case and beta to, for you to guys to see. I mean, it, it's, we will see the differences are minor, but if you do the bipolar one, you already have subsumed the MOSFET in it because you set alpha to one and you know, R, pi, R pi essentially goes to infinity, so it becomes open circuit. So other than that, everything is the same. So in that case, right, so this is basically the basic stage, R2 and R1 with V in, which is also the same thing as a mass, I mean, similar to the mass variation, R2, R1, V in. Now, we are assuming now that they have all the capacitor C pi, the capacitor C mu, which we'll call the same in both of them. And then we also assume that we have a capacitor CL, a load capacitor, right? Again, by looking at this circuit, you should be able to tell me how many poles and how many zeros we have, right? You should be able, to, and even where the zero is, et cetera, et cetera. So how many poles do we have? Two, two not three, right? Why? Because there are only two initial conditions you can define. You can define the voltage of this guy and the voltage of this guy, and if you define those two, the voltage of this guy is already fixed. So you have two degrees of freedom. Another way to see that is a capacitive loop, purely capacitive loop, meaning a loop that has only capacitors in it. If there's a resistor somewhere in the middle, that's not a capacitive loop. Uh, okay, and how many zeros? How many, the maximum, no, exactly, one. A maximum number of elements that you can simultaneously infinite value and get a non-zero transfer function. It's a mouthful, but that's what the exact definition is. Which is one, because only CMU, shorting of CMU will produce a non-zero transfer function. Does it switch the polarity of the gain? Yes, it's an inverting stage. If you, if you short it, it becomes a non-inverting stage. So it's a right half plane zero. So we know everything. I mean, we know a lot about this already by looking at it. But let's write the, so, and we can look at the small signal model. So we can say Vn, R1, R pi. For this one, the hybrid pi, when there's no degeneration in the emitter or the source, the hybrid pi model works better, is easier to deal with. Um, and then you have, R2, I'm not showing RO because if there is an RO, it would be, we can absorb it into R2 and calling that combination just whatever it's R2. So I'm not losing any generality by just showing RO and not showing RO. Uh, uh, just showing R2 and not showing RO. So there's a C pi here, C mu here, and CL here. We know that we have the capacitive loop, we still have the capacitive loop between those three capacitors, so that's fine. So, the time constants, or transfer constants, either way. So let's start with the time constant for this one. So tau, the zeros, the ZVTs, the first batch, is Z pi zero, I'm sorry, tau pi zero, tau mu zero, and tau L zero. What is tau pi zero? What is the resistance seen by C pi when the source is nulled and the other elements are zero valued? In this case, you only have capacitors, so all the other elements are open circuited. R1 parallel R pi times C pi. And here you have C mu times, these are, these are things we've done before, so we'll look 
too quickly. What is the resistance seen by this guy? The R left plus R right plus times GM R left R right, right? Effective GM. So basically, in this case, R left is R1 parallel R pi plus R right, which is R2 plus GM. In this case, since there's no degeneration, GM is GM. GM capital is GM lowercase. GM R2 1 plus, uh, sorry, times um, R1 parallel R pi. By the way, this capital GM, the way it's defined when you have the generation, has nothing to do with the large signal GM. It's ambiguity of notation, if you will. They have nothing to do with each other. They're two different things. Um, so, and then uh, we are not using that capital GM here anyway because you don't have the generation. And tau L, what is the tau L? What is the resistance seen by CL? When the source is nulled, all the other resistors are shorted. Oh, sorry, all the other capacitors are zero valued or opened. R2. R2, because the source is zero, this voltage is zero, so this one, which is GMV pi, if this is V pi, is going to be zero, so this is going to open circuit, so you can see it just R2. So it's CL R2. So those are your first batch of time constants. The second set of time constants, we need to calculate. Right? So let's calculate, for example, tau mu pi. What is tau mu pi? When C pi is infinite valued, meaning it's shorted here, okay? So if this is shorted, this disappears too, right? So what is the resistance seen by that guy? Just R2. So it's C mu R2. The next time constant is tau pi L. Tau pi L. When L is infinite valued, what is this, what you see here? If this is infinite valued and it's shorted, right, this still is the same resistance, right? So this is not going to change. So it's going to be C pi R1 parallel R pi. And then the other one is tau mu um, L. What is tau mu L? Resistance, the, capa the, time, the resistance seen by mu when this guy is shorted. When this guy is shorted, essentially R right, it's the same thing as before, but R right is become zero. So anything that has R2 will become zero, so it becomes just basically that from C mu R1 parallel R pi. You can see that time constants actually become easy. These higher order time constants are simpler. Because the more elements that are usually kind of like shorting and opening, so it makes life easier, not more difficult to go to higher order ones. OK, so with these, I can calculate B1 and B2, which should be sufficient, right? But let's, because of the analysis the study that we did in the beginning, we know that they have only two poles. But let's see if you didn't know. What let's see what happens. Let's see where that rule comes from. Okay? So in that case, for example, if I had a tau pi 0, tau mu pi, then I had to calculate a tau L mu pi, right? What is tau L mu pi? If C mu and C pi are both short-circuited, what is the resistance seen across here? This and that are both short-circuited. Zero, because this is short-circuiting to ground. So that resistance is zero, so it is, yes, it's CL times zero. That is where that rule comes from. That's why a capacitive loop kills that one order, reduce orders by, reduces the order by one, because the last time constant will become zero. Because there's a path, there's a combination that all of them except the one that you have in the loop with everything else shorted will produce a zero resistance, a zero time constant. So anyway, for, are we done? Well, as far as the denominator is concerned, we are done. Right? And we've done the numerator before, really. And the numerator part hasn't changed, because the only non-zero term for the, of, the transfer, of the transfer constants is h mu. right? All the other ones are zero. 
h mu is the only non-zero one, right? Because if you have h, we may say, how about h mu pi or h mu l? Because if you have l or pi in the numer in the in the superscript, you either shorting this or shorting that, both of which results in a zero output. Right? So the only non-zero term is this guy. And this is something we can, it's, it's pretty straightforward to calculate. So when you short circuit it, basically you will have the RM here and all those things. But the long and short of it is that it would give you exactly the same results we calculated before, which is that the, the, the numerator term is really A0, which is the DC gain, or which is H0. Well, H0, of course, is non-zero too. Um, is the A0, which is the gain. Which would be, so the numerator would be A0 times 1 minus, and this is the calculation we've done before, uh, C mu, Rm C mu, S. So that's your right half plane 0. And we did this before, so I mean, it's straightforward, you will see. Now the other thing that to keep in mind when you're calculating these things is that I had, we had six choices here. I picked these three. If you pick the other ones, you can also calculate it and you will get the right result. But some of them become a little bit longer than this, these. How did I know which ones to pick to get the shortest one? Well, I have to think about what would I get if I picked short circuit which one, right? So I try to go, I try to keep them, the superscripts of the, because the superscripts here would go with these subscripts, right? I try to keep keep the ones that have a superscript here that went with the, these, the ones that are, have a shorter time constant. I mean, this is just like heuristic. This is not a, I mean, you can do whatever you want. It will just get still the right result, but just a calculation. But you see, if I pick the ones that have a shorter thing here, the likelihood of getting something that's in simplified form is higher. If I had done some tau pi mu, then I had to multiply this by something, and that something was also some complex thing. And when you multiply it and simplify, these complex things cancel each other. You got that so simple product. So think about what it is going to pair up with. Again, you don't have to, but make your life easier if you can. Right? So anyway, so the denominator terms, of course, we have the B1 and B2. So let's calculate B1 and write down B1 and B2. B1 is the sum of these three. Which you can actually now, if you write it together and add them up, you will see that it can be written as r1, r pi, we've done this before again, uh, times c pi plus 1 plus gm r2 c mu. From that term, plus um, r2 times c mu plus CL. And this is the Miller multiplication factor, right? This is 1 plus the intrinsic gain of the stage. So this is C mu multiplied because of the Miller effect. Because one, the input side goes up by x, the output goes down by negative ax, so the current across the capacitor is 1 plus a times greater. So it appears like a capacitor that's 1 plus a times larger, C mu. Again, done before. Reviewing quickly. So now let's look at B2, which is something we haven't done before. Let's look at B2. Let's write it up. So I have tau pi. I have this product. So I have C pi C mu um, R2 times R1 parallel R2. Or, sorry, R1 parallel R pi. Then you have, when we have, so you have this pair. And then we have this pair, and then we'll use this pair. So that second pair is plus C pi C mu, I'm sorry, C pi, not C pi C mu, C mu C L times R2 times R1 parallel R2, or R, uh, I'm sorry, R pi plus the last combination, which is this guy, which is you get C mu C L. Oh, oh. No, that was C pi, sorry. This is C pi C L, 
for the first first one. And then the last one is C mu CL. Again, R2 times R1 parallel R pi, which you can easily see where you can see this is a common term, the resistors. So you can factor it out. So it becomes R1 parallel R pi, which is the R left, really, times R2, which is the R right, times the sum of the two-way products of the capacitors. Sometimes this is shown in the shorthand format as R left times R right times C delta to emphasize the two, uh, sum of the two-way pro uh, two products of the capacitors. And that sum is actually important when we talk about this. Th this is important when we talk about, especially when we talk about compensation in op amps, especially if you do Miller compensation. This sum will reappear. We'll talk about this and we'll see what it does. It does something really interesting as you, basically in an op amp, one of the ways to make it st stable in frequency is that you have a gain stage like this. You can actually add an explicit capacitor here, extra capacitor CMU. And what that does, it actually makes that input pole very large because of the Miller multiplication. So you make it very stable at the input. But the other thing that it does, which is very useful and interesting and really kind of fortuitous, really, is that it makes the second pole go out. It pushes the second pole out. It's a really useful thing in an op amp. And it's because of the way the sum behaves, this, this sum of the products behaves. We'll see it. So I'm putting that in the back of your head. So, so this is basically your common emitter, right? So you have A0 here, and then you have 1 plus B1S plus B2S squared, which these are the B1 and B2. You can plug them in if you really want to do that. So what did we learn extra? A little bit. We learned that there's this sum of products part in the B2. This is the way B2 looks. It doesn't look very complicated. B2 is R left, R right times this sum of the products squared. Uh, or, sum of the products, which is basically you show that C squared, C delta squared, right? Um, and you also have this right half plane zero, which is around ab above FT, actually. Because if you look at that, that's GM over C mu. FT is GM over C mu plus C pi, or omega T is GM over C mu plus C pi. And this is even higher than that, because it doesn't have the C pi element. So it's a really high frequency right half plane zero. Now, does it make it completely irrelevant? No, not necessarily. Because you remember, the phase component of a polar zero extends beyond even a decade below. A decade below, you have about 5.7 degrees contribution. So even if you're a decade below this frequency, you still get some few degrees of this thing. And this can reduce your phase margin, for example, when you're doing an op amp and stabilization of an op amp. And again, we'll see that and we get to the stabilization. Okay, so, so that's for common emitter, right? Um, how about the common collector or common uh, or source follower? Let's do source follower for that one. Uh, let's go to that. Just let me make sure that I have my correct stuff. Okay, so let's start with the source follower that has a input resistance and output resistance. So now we are going to a source follower. So let's say you have an input resistance R1 and an output resistance R2. And then now let's say that you have the V in and this is V out. And let's say you have the C mu. We've almost done this completely. And C pi. And then you have this. Let's say you have a CL before. Uh, so we've done, again, most of this before. So I'm just going to do it um, quickly, rather quickly. Um, we need to calculate the time constants associated with this. Um, we have and transfer constant. Again, but before we do that, we want to see how many poles, how many zeros we expect. How many poles? With these three capacitors? Two. two poles, right? Because you have, again, a capacitive loop. 
Because from an AC perspective, this is ground. Supply voltages are ground, right? AC means fluctuations. AC means derivative. Derivative of a constant is zero. So, um, okay, so two poles and how many zeros? One zero. Right half plane or left half plane? Left half plane because this doesn't change the polarity. In fact, you can tell something else even from this. Shorting of this capacitor, does it fundamentally change the behavior of the circuit completely? No. It's still kind of like, it gives you some gain, a little bit plus than one or something like that, depending on R1 and R2 are, right? It's still kind of like a buffer, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, depending on R1 versus Rm and things of that sort are. So you can, that tells you that that, by just looking at that small change, you can tell that there is a pole zero pair that are close to each other. You remember in the case of a common emitter we just talked about, it changed the polarity and it changed the gain significantly. Because if, let's say, your stage had a gain of, I don't know, 80, it made it less than 1. And it changed the polarity. So it means that that 0 is way far away from where the associated pole may be. But this here is different. Now, one thing you have to be very careful about, and this is a common mistake in many textbooks, is associating poles with nodes in general. There is no one-to-one. -one. You can't say there's a pole on this node, there's a pole on this node. You can see, I mean, these capacitor combinations can be even, you can get fewer poles and nodes and all those things. Sometimes if you have stages that are isolated, we talked about this briefly, if you had uncoupled poles or uncoupled time constants, that can happen. But it's not generally true. You have to be very careful because you can draw wrong conclusions from that. But anyway, the co this, this is correct, the way we are doing it. Uh, okay, now, so we know that what, it, what it, it is what it is, right? So let's do the time constant and transfer constants. Time constant, so tau mu, and we've done these, some of these before. So what is tau mu zero? What is the resistance seen by C mu when the other cap capacitors are open? Just R1, right, in this case. It's uh, R1 um, C mu. What is tau pi zero? What's the resistance by that, seen by that guy? You have to be careful because now you have these guys right here, right? So we have to use those expressions we derived, which is basically R1 plus R2, 1 over Gm R2 times C pi. We did this before too. And then tau L0, which we haven't done before. What is tau L0? What is the resistance seen by Cl? What is it? R2 parallel Rm, right? So R2 parallel Rm Cl. So those are your ZVTs. Now you need three more for the higher order ones, right? So for example, you can do uh, tau mu pi. So what is the resistance seen by this guy when C pi is shorted? R1 parallel R2, right? Because C pi shorts it, basically. So it becomes C mu R1 parallel R2. Now, how about tau L pi? With the CLC when C mu is shorted. C pi is shorted, sorry, C pi. Again, you see R1 parallel R2, right? Right? So you see CL R1 parallel R2. And then um, what else do you see when you have tau, and then tau mu L? When L is shorted, what, tell me you, what does tell me you see? What, is, what does C mu see? If this is shorted to ground, the resistance seen looking in this direction is zero, infinity, right? You just see R1. So it becomes R1 C mu. So we know the denominator completely, right? We do. What is the denominator? Well, we can calculate B1 and B2. 
So B1 is the sum of these three time constants. And we can approximate, and we can see what is it approximately under like certain simplifying assumption. And B2 is determined by this three-way product. So you can actually say, for example, this times that plus this times that plus this times, no, no, not that. This times this. Right? Which you can calculate. So the three-way products, if you write this one, you can see it simplifies because this is R1, R2 divided by R1 plus R2. So they got, these guys cancel. So you get the first term is going to be C pi C mu R1, R2 over 1 plus Gm R2. This term the same way. So you can actually, in fact, factor those two among them. You can write it as C um, C pi C mu, C pi C L, and then you have this guy, which would be basically what it is, right? It is C L C mu uh, R2 parallel R M R1. Now, if you assume that R M is much smaller than R2, right, and R1, then it simplifies the expressions that we had before. So you can see that there's a pole associated from the, this first one, we saw that we have a pole around the Rm uh, C pi plus C mu. So that's what we get. Now, so that's interesting. But what is more interesting about this is the input and output resistance of this thing. We've looked at the output resistance of this. But let's do the output resistance a little bit more precisely here. So maybe I should, I'm going to erase or put this down here. So this is B2, C pi C mu plus C pi C L plus uh, um, C L C mu R2 parallel R M R1. OK. But let's look at the input and output resistance, because that's probably a little bit more interesting. I mean, it, it, this is the important too, but it, we've talked about this before. So, Let's look at its output impedance. Now, we want to determine what is the output impedance looking into here. Now, of course, you can make our lives more difficult by including everything. Or you could say, look, you know, the impedance, really whatever it is, it's this impedance, the intrinsic output impedance, parallel with this R2, R2 and CL. Right? So we can make our lives easier by just looking at that. So let's do that. Let's, let's basically can say the equivalent circuit I'm really interested in is this circuit. And this is R1. And of course, in that case, it's grounded anyway. Because it's the output impedance. And you have a C mu and C pi. And what is this output impedance? So, for calculating that, you need to calculate a bunch of time constants, right? So you need to have the first, what is the, what is the thing that you're trying to calculate? Impedance or admittance? If it's impedance, what does it mean? It means that I'm driving it with what? A current source, right? That's important because we need to know if it's open or shorted, that node, when it's nulled. So, if you are driving it with a current source, so okay, what are the time constants? So you have a tau pi zero, and you have a tau mu zero, right? The tau pi zero is what? The resistance, what is the resistance seen by C pi when that source is open? The only thing that's connected to it at that point is Rm, right? If you look at the T model. So it is going to be Rm C pi. Now, how about C mu? What does it see? Well, it's open, doesn't matter. It's just like R1, so C mu R1. And then similarly, you can calculate one of the other ones. Uh, you can calculate tau mu pi, or tau pi mu, doesn't matter. Uh, tau mu pi. When I short circuit this thing, will something change? When I short circuit C pi? No, because this guy is still open. Right? So it would be the same time constant. It would be basically uh, C mu R1. So these are the time constants you need for that thing. And then you can calculate the fourth one, and you'll see that the two-way products are the same. 
so we know what we need to know for the denominator. And for the numerator, we have the z's, right? So you have the impedances. So you have z naught. What is z naught? What is z naught? What do you see when the capacitors are open? Looking into the source. You see just Rm, right? So Z0 is Rm. What is Z pi? What do you see when, you, when C pi is infinite valued, when it's shorted? R1. What is Z mu? When you short circuit that, you still see Rm, right? So it's Rm. And then what is z mu pi when you short circuit both? Zero. Okay. So you can combine these and form the transfer function. So if you write this as a, as a transfer function or an impedance function, it looks like this. It looks like Rm from this guy plus the sum, sum of the, the products of these things. So if you write all of those and simplify it, you will see that it looks like this. Rm1 plus R1 C pi plus C mu s divided by 1 plus R1 C mu s times 1 plus Rm C pi s. So what does it tell us? Right, what do we learn from this? If you actually look at this, you can see, first of all, what is it at 0, at DC? Well, it should be, right? Rm. It has one left half plane 0 and two right half plane. I'm sorry, two left half plane poles and one left half plane 0. OK. The other thing that you notice is that, yeah, I mean, so there's a, there's a, there are two poles and a 0. And if you actually look at a set of parameters um, that you can assume that if you assume that R1 is much greater than Rm, then you, if you plot the magnitude of this thing, it will look like that. It will look like this versus the frequency. So it will go up. So this is 20 log magnitude of the z of j omega. You start at Rm. Then it actually, if this condition holds, then it starts going up. Then it becomes flat. Then it keeps going down. So this is happening at the zero frequency, which is given here, which is the lowest of all of them, if this condition holds. So the zero in this case happens before the two poles. And then you have one pole here. So this is the zero. You have a pole here at 1 over R1 C mu, and you have a second pole here at GM over C, uh, C pi, which is actually greater than omega t. Right? And you can see why, right? Because C mu is not there. So this is happening at very high frequencies. So what is this behavior? So the output impedance of a common source starts off as resistive. If this condition holds, then it goes up. And becomes in this region, it's really inductive, because it's an inductance. Inductor is something that whose impedance increases with frequency, right? So it looks inductive. Then what, it, what happens is that it becomes flat, again becomes resistive. And then eventually, at very high frequency, it becomes capacitive. Now, why is this important? You may make a circuit, and you have a buffer in there. And then you make it, and then you look at it, and you see that output is ringing. And you may say, OK, well, I don't have inductors. It must be some inductor. It may not necessarily be an explicit inductor. This output can behave inductively in a certain range of frequencies. And that, for example, can have an underdamped response, a resonance response behavior, things of that sort. And in fact, if you want to use it, there are ways to take advantage of it and actually use it for something useful. So 
Now, in this can be model. There's a mod that you can create a model for this. You can say this is, there's an equivalent model for this, which is exact. Well, you can, you can make an exact model, which is in your handout. But this model is exact. The exact values are there, and we will show the approximate values to you. Now, I'll show it to you. So the output can be modeled like this. There's an inductor, there's an RA, an RB, and a C. So this is what Z of S looks like. To, to reproduce this behavior. And you can approximate, when, when that assumption holds, that R1 is greater than Rm, L becomes Rm R1 C pi 1 plus C pi over C mu squared. C is C pi parallel C mu. Ra is R1 parallel Rm 1 plus C mu over C pi and Rb is Rm. These are in your handouts. C pi over C mu. And this is an approximate one, and there's an even more an exact one in that footnote on the following page that shows you exactly what these not values are. And the key thing is to realize that this value of this inductor is proportional to the Rm, is proportional to C pi, and it's proportional to R1. Those are the key things to remember. And this is a correction factor, really. So if you want to manipulate that inductance, you can actually control it by changing R1, R, Rm, and C pi. C pi you may not be able to change that much, but R1 and Rm, by playing with that, you can actually set it to an inductance that you want if you want to get a certain behavior out of the stage. OK? Any questions on that? All right, so now let's do the input impedance of the source of, of, the, of the same stage, of the follower. And you may say, what do you mean by input impedance? Well, well, the input resistance of this thing is zero, but the input impedance is not necessarily, right? So let's, and if you're trying to calculate the input impedance, does it make sense for us to make our lives more difficult by having an R1 here? No. Let's even make it simpler. Let's even see, let's see if you had a purely capacitive load. In other words, R2 is large, or this is a current source or something like that. Let's see what that does because it has an interesting behavior. And we can learn something, a couple of interesting techniques and uh, points about the behavior of something like this. So let's say you have, we can make it very, very simple. Let's make this only C pi and only CL. Let's ignore C mu. Because C mu, if you, and we, don't, we are not really ignoring it because whatever this equivalent input impedance is, you can put this parallel combination this, this combination, this RC there, to make it complete for an equivalent model. So that part can be separated anyway. So we are looking at the input impedance looking into this guy. So, oh, yes, thank you, CL, not CMU. Okay, thank you. OK, so let's calculate this input impedance. Well. Let's calculate its input admittance. Why, why input admittance? Because think about it. What is the input impedance at zero? Why, did, why, why is it preferred to? Because if I, ca if I try to go calculate input impedance, then my z0 would be what? Infinity. Which then I will have to do this ambiguation, which I will show you how to do in a minute. But let's make our, try not to make, acti at least not actively make our lives more difficult. Sometimes it just happens. Make, but the decisions we make, but at least if we know, not knowingly do it. So we are trying to calculate y of s. And of course, from that, we can calculate 1 over z of s, right? We can, when, once we calculate that y of s, we can calculate z of s. But let, we are calculating y of s. And this is an important distinction, as I mentioned earlier. So what kind of source should I use here? A voltage source, exactly, right? Because an impedance, admittance is the ratio of a, of a current to a voltage. So I should put a voltage source here, Vn, to drive it, which is a better thing because you have a node that's on one side high impedance, so that you have something that on the other side makes it low impedance. So that's why we are calculating. Okay, so to calculate that, we need to calculate a bunch of stuff, right? I mean, we need to calculate time constants and transfer constants. 
Um, so let's start with one. Let's start with the transfer constants. What is y zero? When the capacitors are zero, what is the admittance looking into that node? It's zero because the impedance is infinity, right? Or the resistance is infinity, so the conductance is zero. So what is y uh, L? And L is infinite valued. Still, the input resistance is infinity, so the input conductance is zero. What is y uh, pi? What is it? When this one is shorted, this one is open. No, this is shorted. You're shorting across the GM. GM is gone. It's still zero because you still see an open circuit here, right? So, so it's infinite resistance, zero conductance. The only non-zero term, this is interesting, right? The only non-zero term is actually y pi l. If both of them are now shorted, what do you see? Infinity, because you have a short circuit, right? So you can say, well, these are not good. <laughs> right? You can see it right away, right? This is a problem. OK, how do we solve this problem? Sometimes th things happen. If you simplify it too much, sometimes it happens. OK, so how do we deal with that? Well, relatively simple. Just put a resistor. I mean, in practice, there's always some resistance here. Call it Rx. And then do your calculations and set Rx to 0 at the end of your calculations. So if we do this, how would our transfer constants change? Would any, let's see. Y0 would not change, right? Y pi would not, y, L, y pi would not change. Because you know, you short circuit this guy, still it's open on this side. Y L would not change, because you short circuit this, but still the input impedance is, input resistance is infinity. So these three will remain the same. The only thing that would change is Y pi L. So instead of being infinity, what would it become? One over Rx. OK? And of course, if Rx goes to 0, it goes to infinity. Fine. Now, when we do our time constant calculations, we should take this into account the same way. So there are two time, there, we really need three time constants. Right? There are two ZVTs, which are tau pi 0 and tau mu 0. So what are they? What is tau pi 0? The resistance, what is the resistance seen by this guy when the other one is when this is open circuit, what is the resistance now? Rm. So it's Rm C pi. What is the resistance seen by, well, there's no mu, C tau L. What is the resistance seen by this guy? When the other one is open. On this side, you see Rm. You see Rx, exactly. So Rm plus Rx C L. And then there, you need to calculate one more. I want I pick the one that goes with that guy. Um, it doesn't matter really. But um, so it would be tau l pi. So what do I see if it's short circuited? Just see the Rx. Rx C L. All right. So we're done. Do I need to calculate the? Okay. So do I? I no, we're not complete. Well, we're done because you need one of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're done. So what is that transfer function, right? I mean, you can calculate it. So you can see that A1, A0 is 0. A1 is 0, right? Because these two are both 0. A2, which is this guy times this times that, is, OK, so let, let's write that. A2 is y pi l times tau pi 0 tau l pi, which is 1 over Rx, which is 1 over Rx times um, Rm c pi times Rx cl. Now you see what's happening, right? The Rx's are canceling. So this Rx cancels that Rx, so you're left with A2 being Rm C pi Cf. Fine. 
And how about B1 and B2? Well, B1 is the sum of these two. So you can see Rm times C pi plus Cl plus Rx Cl. And then B2 is going to be this times that, which is going to be Rm C pi Rx Cl. Which now, if you set Rx to 0, so for Rx going to 0, this becomes 0. This becomes Rm times C pi plus Cl. And that's what it is. So that's how you do this ambiguation if that happens. Now, you can write the transfer function, right? Let's write the transfer. Let's write the y because it has some interesting properties. y of s, so it only has the a2, so it's rm c pi cl s squared divided by, so and b2 became 0, so it only we have to have the first order term, rm c pi plus cl s. So that's y. And you, and you may say, OK, I want to know what the impedance is. Now, if you want to calculate the impedance, you've done it properly. You've used the proper source. That's fine. Now, the impedance is 1 over this, by definition. So what is 1 over that? Let's look at the two terms. Let's write this term. This, so, so you have this divided by that. And what you will see is that RMs cancel. And what you have, you have the 1 over C pi plus 1 over Cl times 1 over S, or you can write it as this way, right? Plus 1 over Rm C pi Cl S squared. Now, the first term is a simple term, right? I mean, so this is basically the parallel combination of C pi and Cl. So it says that the input impedance consists of two parts. And since this is an impedance, so the first part, the first component is the parallel combination of these two. So the input looks like parallel combination of C pi and Cl, which is basically C pi plus Cl. You should try it really this way. I should write it probably this way. No, eh, no. What am I doing? Making a mess. This is not a parallel combination. This is the series combination. Sorry. This is the series combination, but we are showing it with this notation for capacitors. It's C1, C2 divided by C1 plus C2. So we are defining this as a notation, right? We are saying A parallel B is AB over A plus B. If you define it that way, then you can show. So this is basically that combination. You can write as C pi. To avoid confusion, you can write as C pi plus C1 plus C. I, I like this notation because it's basically a mathematical operation, really. It's half of the harmonic mean. You want to think about it. But OK, and there is something else here. This thing is the really interesting thing. What is that? What kind of element is it? You can actually write it, if you want to write it slightly differently, you can write it as gm over that, because it was 1 over rm. You can write it as gm over c pi divided by cls. What is this thing? What kind of element is this? Negative resistance. Yeah, that's one way to think about it, right? Because if you set s to j omega, it becomes negative 1 over, or gm over c pi c mu omega squared. So it becomes a frequency dependent negative resistance. But it also from, if you don't go to the omega, if you look at it from a just s, complex frequency perspective, I mean, what you said is completely correct. And I think that's relevant, uh, what you said. But another way to think about it is, and we'll come back to that, by the way. But another way is that, what is this? What is the closest thing to this? What is the thing that has some sort of a 1 over s behavior? whose impedance is 1 over something s. It's a capacitor, right? So this is like a capacitor, but instead of s, it's s squared. 
It's sometimes called a supercapacitor. But as you pointed out, if you look at it versus frequency, it actually shows negative resistance. A frequency dependent negative resistance, which is actually very useful in designing filters, and you know, it's used a lot. And it had actually even a symbol. So that, that's the symbol for this thing. Because it's a supercapacitor, it's like that. I don't know why they put two lines in between. I would have basically made this the symbol. Because it's just like kind of too bad. But anyway, so th that's the symbol. So, and it's sometimes called frequency dependent negative resistance, F FDNR. And it's used a lot in making analog filters and sometimes with oscillators and things of that sort. OK. So that's for some of the interesting properties of the common uh, or source follower. There's one last stage left, which we'll look at. We've looked at this almost exactly this way. And we'll look at it one more time just for completeness to have everything in one place right now. So let's have a common base or common gate and you have an R1 and R2 in driving it. And you have the two capacitors, C pi and C mu. And if you had a CL, even that, considering that this is also ground, so that would be in parallel with C mu. So it wouldn't change anything. So your C mu, what we call, as, what we call C mu can also include CL. You could call it CL plus C mu. These two are in parallel, right? And you don't see it. So these two time constants are actually what we call uncoupled time constants. And as such, they are independent. How many poles, how many zeros do we have? Do we have a zero in this transfer function from the input to the output? This is the output, of course. Do we have a zero? Yes? No? Hmm? If they're both infinite valued, would you get something to the output? Because this is ground. It's short set to ground. So you have no zeros. Well, your zeros are at infinity, basically. That's what it means. Right? So you don't have a finite zero. You have two poles. The poles are uncoupled because shorting or opening of one capacitor does not change the time constant seen by the other, affect the, the resistance seen by the other one. So the transfer function is what we derived, it, derived before. So there's a time constant here at the input, which is 1 plus R1 C pi S. And there's one at the output, 1 plus R2 C mu S. And this is basically the DC gain, A0. This is the transfer function. It's the most well-adjusted stage of all. It's really easy to deal with. It has an input pole, output pole, no zeros. They're not coupled to each other. Very easy to work with and analyze. It doesn't mean that it does everything well, but it's, it's that easygoing guy right? or gal. You know, eh, you just hang out and everything works out, just like nothing, just like, eh, sure. No problem. Or no, thank you. That's it. Uh, OK, so that's for that. So we, we covered the three fundamental stages that we had. And you saw some of them. There were a lot more elaborate discussions for some versus the others. But you can see that this method can be applied. The point, again, of TTC and applying it to these things is to understand that you can stop. I mean, in a lot of these things, I felt compelled to kind of go and take show you all of the time constants, but a lot of times you just, you just stop. You say, you know what, I know that the zero for this thing is going to be at very high frequency. I'm not even going to worry about the transfer constants. Or I know that I have two poles and I want to find a dominant parameter. I look at the time constant, calculate them independently. I see these two are not important, so I'm not going to even calculate the second order was associated with those. Right? So in practice, if you do it correctly, it's even less compl complex than we are doing it now. All right, any questions on that? Okay, let's.